Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in this ship thickness screening webinar from TerraSource Global. I'm Conrad Matula. I'm the Estimating Applications Manager for TerraSource. I've uh, been with the company for quite a while. Why screen chips according to thickness? Well, there's some answers. Uh, uniform chips provide a more uniform pulp, which improves yield, quality, and economy of the uh, pulping process. Fewer oversized chips in the cook means less uncooked or partially cooked rejects, which must be reintroduced into the process. And when these rejects are reintroduced into the digester, they take up room and use more chemicals. And it's an interesting note that a 50% reduction in rejects results in a large savings to the pulp mill. A simple analogy to cooking chips is like cooking potatoes, big ones, small ones, and mid-sized. Uh, you bring the water to the boil for a period of time and then check those spuds. The small ones are mushy, the mid-sized are just right, and you would not want to eat the big potatoes unless you take them out and recook them. This is much the same with chips. You want to have the uniform size chips so when you're cooking them, they all come out the same. This is a pretty typical distribution curve of what a chip sample would look like coming into a screening system. Uh, on the left-hand side of the curve, you see where you have fines and pins, and fines are usually less than three millimeter round hole. Pins are those chips that are retained on the three millimeter round hole. And then the exit range is between a uh, two millimeter bar opening to a eight millimeter bar opening. The over thick would be plus eight millimeter, maybe up to 12 or 14 millimeter. And then oversized chips, those are the chips that would uh, be retained on a 45 millimeter round hole. Uh, those are the oversized. This is a not a very good picture, but sort of a representation of fines, pins, accepts, and overs. It's the chips in the middle that you want to retain for your pulping process. Of course, you don't want fines in there and pins in there because they'll consume more chemicals than desired. And like I said, the oversized chips will come out as knots. So after chip thickness screening, your curve wants to look sort of like this, where you have fewer fines, still some pins, uh, a greater percentage of accepts, and very few uh, overthick and no oversized chips. If you notice back in that uh, last picture, and I'll go back to it real quick, all these holes, uh, these pans in this uh, classifier all round holes. Uh, while there is a direct relationship between the length of a chip and the thickness, uh, there are chips that are chunky enough that it will pass through some of these round holes and still be over thick. So when we do an analysis on the chip, thick, uh, chip thickness system, uh, we'll use a chip classifier that actually measures the quantities of chips at certain thicknesses and gives you a, a distribution curve. Uh, we're going to talk about the different screening equipment for overthick chip removal. Now, bear in mind that there's a lot of companies out there who manufacture this equipment, but I'm only going to be talking about the uh, products that Raider uh, provides and give a little history on the thickness screening. Uh, Raider got into the screening business in the early 70s when we introduced disc, disc, plain old disc screens, or better known as scalping screens, into the forest products industry. And then we progressed into uh, disc screens for thickness screening and modification to a flat disc screen to a V screen and then probably to a the bar screen where we are today. A typical uh, chip thickness screening system layout would look similar to this where you have a, a scalping screen for removing uh, slabs or ghost overs that will be rejected to a bunker. Uh, the throughput from that scalping screen uh, would go onto the primary thickness screen. And with the bar type thickness screen, uh, we know that the vast majority of fines and pins fall out in the very first section of the, of the screen. So we could direct those chips to a fine screen for fines removal with the pins and accept chips going onto the accepts belt. Uh, the remainder of the 
thickness screen uh, allows the accept minus eight millimeter to, to pass through to the accept belt, and the overthick onto a air density separator, where uh, knots, dense metal, dense materials, trap could be taken out, and into an overthick chip processor, where the chips are conditioned and down to a uh, some accept chips. For gross overs removal, I think everybody's pretty familiar with the uh, disk screen. Here's a pretty wide spacing. The intent here is to let the chips pass through freely and let slabs or cards or long pieces come off the end of the rejects bunker. And this is just a uh, drawing of a screen. Uh, the infeed has to come in properly. And the overs come off the end of the screen and the screen material passes through. First generation of thickness screens are the primary flat screens. Uh, Raider introduced these in the late 1970s. Uh, like I said, these flat screens, but they had a eight millimeter to seven half millimeter IFO uh, between the discs. That's interface opening between opposing discs. And while the original screens uh, we used spacers and discs as we have in our scalping screens, uh, we then developed into the Raider Flex design which gave more uh, adaptability for the screening system. Uh, the modules, those Raider Flex disk assemblies, these modules here put together 12-inch modules and slid onto a square tube, which made holding tolerances a lot better. The uh, second generation primary screens, that, which came about in the early 1980s, were V-screens. And these are very similar to the flat screens, except we you bend them up on the sides and you feed the material from into the middle so the chips would progress up either side of the B screen over to coming off accepts going through. Uh, these two use the uh, Raider Flex uh, shaft disc assemblies, and there's still a couple of these machines in operation in the world. The third generation primary thickness screens is the bar screen. Uh, this was introduced in the late 80s, and it was a new concept in screening, not using discs. Uh, the chips pass through these bars. The uh, bar screen is each section of the bar screen is made up of uh, two rigid frames that uh, hold the bars in position. They alternately move up and down to move the chips down the screen. The spaces or slots between the bars uh, are accurately preset and locked in the place to, look the, uh, to establish the opening where you want to pass chips through. So, so when activated, the eccentricity of the shafts so the causes the bars to rise and fall uh, alternately and pushes, you know, tumble the chips down down the screen. This is a drive arrangement on a bar screen. This shaft and this shaft are common to the frame that holds the bars. And this shaft and this shaft are common to a second frame that holds the interspaced bars. So the timing of this machine is very critical. Uh, to keep all the bars operating properly. And each of these eight foot sections uh, has a special bearing housings and take ups for tensioning. These are tiny belt drives, so they have to be kept clean. And we have a pretty good seal on the outside, and they need to be maintained. Each of the sections has a 10 horsepower concentric shaft reducer, which drives drives the uh, machine. And we have a reason for having it only eight feet long, uh, too too longer, too much longer than that, and you get too much bar deflection. And we could stack these screens one behind the other. The uh, principles of bar screen is, if you notice, the bars are not only of different height. 
that they are uh, spaced so small one to small and larger and larger. And as the chip off, the bars move up and down, it allows the chips to tip. Whereas if they're all the same height, the chips will just ride flat across the bar deck. And you can see in this picture, uh, the larger bars and the smaller adjacent bar, shorter adjacent bars, and these are three and a half inch and two and a half inch bars. So the, as the chips come down the screen, the accept chips fall through, and the overthick tumble off the end to the onward chip processor. We talk about stroke and speed on the bar screen. The stroke is the range of motion the bars take. All the red ones operating together, all the blue ones operating together, and you can see how they give a very definite cascade effect for chips to pass through, tumble down, and get sorted. Uh, speed is important because if, if you're running the screen too fast uh, with a light load of material, you'll have chips bouncing on the deck and not doing a good screening job. If it's going too slow, uh, the chips will slide on down the deck with not much agitation. So we Stick to speed so with the loading on the screen, the agitation is optimized. This represents the, the, the speed changes down the screen. Uh, in the first section, we'll be running at 230 RPMs. And in this section, you have fines and some accept chips pass out. Uh, the second section will be 215 RPM. We'll be moving accepts, and the third section is at 200 RPM. Now, this shows a uh, three modular screen, which would be, in our, in our terminology, a 10 by 24, three eight foot sections. You could have a fourth module for 10 by 32, and that center module would also be at 215 RPM, so you'd be at 230, 215, 215, and 200. This sort of demonstrates what the uh, chip bed looks like. At, at the initial loading of the screen, you have a thick chip bed, and so you need more speed so you can keep that bed moving. And as the chips fall through, and this bed depth is lesser on this side, you don't need to run the screen as fast, so we select 215 RPM. And then on the last portion of the screen, we're down at 200 RPM because the, the chip loading is very light. This is a pretty good view of the, the discharge end of a bar screen. Uh, you can see here again where you have the alternating bars, alternating heights. The bars are all locked down and clamped in position to keep the spacings down the bars uh, very parallel and very consistent. Some real advantages with a bar screen is, uh, let's say you want to do more uh, more efficient fine screening underneath the screen. You could close up the first section to look four millimeters, so fewer chips come through, uh, pass through to the fine screen, and provide uh, better screening efficiency on your fine screen. Or you could open up the bars to have more chips pass through, and you could have any assortment arrangement from first uh, deck to the second deck to the third deck, uh, depending on what you're trying to accomplish in your process. Uh, in the past couple of years, a lot of mills have opted to open these decks up to get more throughput, which sort of, you know, it, it does okay for the pulp mill guys because they're getting their chips, but in actuality, uh, it's sort of defeating the purpose of a screening system. The uh, entry to a bar screen has to be uniform. I mean, like if, for any screening device, if you're not distributing chips evenly across the bar screen or a screen, uh, you don't get the full benefit of the screen. Uh, this shows a entry distribution chute that has adjustable baffles inside. So on startup and tuning, these are, baffles can be changed to make sure that those chips as they cascade down like a pinball effect. Uh, fill up the entire base or the entire bed top of the uh, screen. There's also a, uh, you can also use a star feeder above the bar screen, or you could use a distributing screw where you would send the chips in the middle and distribute both sides with a, a variable, op variable opening on the bottom of the screw so you could adjust that, or screw from the, you can from the end and go across. 
the advantage of the screw is it limits the amount of height you might need between your infeed and to the top of the bar screen. This is a good picture of the chips coming off the end of the screen. Uh, these are half-inch bars. They're chamfered. And you can see that a lot of these chips are in suspension because they, they do bounce along, so there's a good opportunity for the uh, axip size, the axip thickness to fall through, and by the same token, gets the big, the chunky stuff uh, off the end of the screen. So <clears throat> we remove the overthick chips. Uh, what do we do with them? I mean, we have to do something. So to process the overchip fraction, uh, it all begins with what's coming off the end of the bar screen. Uh, this floor contains overthick chips, knots, uh, some gross overs. It could be trap metal or metal and rocks, depending on where a position of or where in the system you have a scalping screen or what kind of metal protection or metal detection device is in the system to prevent trap from getting onward. Uh, the air density separating system, which we're looking at right here, uh, is employed to remove those rocks and knots and trap metal from, uh, from the overthick chips. This is a good schematic of an ADS system. The, uh, this is the infeed distribution, and it's important that the chips are fed evenly across the uh, opening, the depth opening of this uh, infeed airlock. And they could be from 48 to 80, 82 inches wide. And it's important to have a good curtain of material falling into that because if you don't, uh, air channeling up will channel past chips, uh, you lose conveying, and the system will be ineffective. So this takes the chips in. Uh, they go through the heavies, rocks, tramps, dense wood would, would fall out. The accept uh, or the overthick chips that can fly go through the cyclone to the discharge airlock, and down to the uh, overthick processing device. Uh, the air that gets pulled off of this captive discharge, oh, it conveys it. That's for pulling the air off to uh, convey the chips. So the advantage is you know, the, it rejects the dense wood, the tramp metals, rocks, uh, from the uh, flow of chips coming through. The major benefit is a reduction in auto rejects. I mean, taking knots out of the system, dense, dense uh, wood out of the chip flow, helps in the pelting process. And also, with the ADS system, it protects the uh, overthick chip processor. Uh, before the chip conditioners are uh, when we used to use chip slicers, it was very, very important to protect that piece of gear because if anybody's had one, of those, had one of those slicers and dropped a rock through it, they know what kind of damage it could cause. So the components of the ADS system, uh, there's an infeed chute to make sure the distribution to the infeed airlock is proper. Uh, this rotary vein feeder is just a rubber tip straight bladed feeder, which allows the material into the uh, separation area. And this is the separation chamber. Uh, this is where the air and the chips blend. Uh, the, the baffles are adjustable. We set those up on startup. It's so it's sucking the air up through the column. There's a, there's a flotation velocity for all wood chips. Uh, when the chips uh, are light enough or of such a nature that they, at the right proper velocity, they will go up. The uh, knots and stones, of course, the velocity is different. And there's not enough air to pull them up, so they will fall through. And these uh, baffles are adjustable. Here's the uh, the air side, the chip side coming up uh, through the Mark III elbow. Uh, into a cyclone separator with a, a captive top, so you pull the air through the top. And the air elbows and air piping on the opposite side, you can't see them in this picture, but they go down to the fan. 
Uh, he's a centrifugal fan uh, with a inlet damper on it. Uh, monitor the differential pressure across the cyclone to uh, open or close that damper as needed. Another thing we could do is take the air off the discharge of the fan and provide it to a plenum around the ADS intaker where the air comes up to the bottom of the separation zone. I'm talking about this area right here. Put a plenum around the, the base of that so as you pull air, the air you pull out, you push back into the system so you can keep it pretty closed loop. Uh, it has benefits in the cold conditions, uh, so you get some warm air circulation from inside the building if possible. Also, it lessens some of the burden on uh, environmental concerns if we can recirculate that uh, particle size. And usually there's an inlet and a discharge silencer with the uh, fan. Uh, like I said before, the operation of the system is depending on the differential pressure across the cyclone. Uh, we measure that, monitor that pressure into a control panel, open or close the, uh, the damper on the fan to optimize performance of the system. Underneath the cyclone, there's a discharge chute, and it's designed especially to make sure that the vortex uh, going through the cyclone is, is broken so the chips fall out and not, don't get carried back up into the top of the cyclone. And then this feeds into the a typical uh, ESW type wood chip feeder that we use in our pneumatic systems. Systems usually have some uh, zero speed switches for the rotary vane feeder, uh, the infeed zone, uh, the rotary airlock feeders, exhaust fan, and it's usually the, in, the uh, screw feeding the ADS system has a speed switch on it. Okay, overthick chips. Uh, what are we going to do with the overthick chips? Well, we like to condition them. And this, this, the uh, Dynaeal 2 chip conditioner takes the overthick chips and fishes them uh, by running the chips through between two uh, pyramid profiled rolls to uh, allow the chips to absorb liquor better. It consists primarily, like I said, of two rolls, uh, specially designed to actually stainless steel segments, and they provide a surface for conditioning, fissuring, the treating the oversize and over the wood chips. Now, sometimes you could put a, a chip through the size of a coffee cup, and when it comes out, it looks like the size of a coffee cup, but it's fissured in such a way that the liquor will definitely penetrate into the fiber. These are the two uh, rolls. This is the uh, static roll or stationary roll with conditioner. And on this side is the uh, dynamic roll. This, this roll is allowed to move in and out. Of course, it's easy access, got nice, nice coupling on it. And the chip conditioner segments, uh, 90 degree segments, and they're all held in place with uh, grade 8 fasteners. And this is a, a view looking down in the nip. This, this is the nip. This is what's between the two uh, conditioning rolls. And you see where the, the pyramids on this roll meet the valleys of this roll. And the desired nip is controlled by mechanical stops. And I'll show you those in a minute. But they prevent the rolls from coming right, from interfering with each, with each other. Uh, usually that nip is set at four millimeters, but it's been known to be set at six or eight millimeters. And this all depends on what the process of wood and what you're trying to get get out of the system. The uh, dynamic roll is uh, held in place by two hydraulic cylinders, and they they're used to keep the pressure on the roll, keep it in position. And the reason we use the hydraulic cylinders is if you should get something big through there and you 
didn't allow it to relieve itself, it'd be catastrophic. So what the hydraulic cylinders do, they allow those rolls to separate, and it's bang that fast where something can go through it. And you'll hear it as it opens and closes quite rapidly to uh, pass that piece of material. Uh, what we used to do on our facility on Portland, Oregon, a long time ago when we first introduced this machine, when, when clients would come out, we'd throw a two-by-four down in there, and it would jump, bang, and scare you half to death, but the two-by-four would come out perfectly fissured. Still look like a two by four, but it would absorb alcohol, uh, liquor. On each of the uh, cylinders is a pressure relief valve to uh, prevent any overpressure in the system. And of course, centralized lubrication for all the bearings, motors, and uh, slide rates for the uh, dynamic slide. Here's a picture of segments being installed or removed. Uh, it's a pretty easy opening top. These uh, profile this, it's pat these, are, these are patented, this configuration. And and like I said before, the surfaces are aligned, so the, the tip of one falls into the valley of the adjacent roll. This better illustrates what's going on inside there. This, this is the static roll held by the bearing. Uh, this is the dynamic roll. And the hydraulic cylinders which, which positioned it on this, this bearing slide. So this roll is free to open this way. But it's held under pressure, so it would take a force to push it, but it's allowed to move. Uh, and here are the nip shins. This is where you mechanically provide a mechanical stop. So this roll never contacts this roll. Like I said, it's usually a four millimeter opening. Uh, it can be five, six millimeters, depending on what you're trying to do. Of course, as you're running the chips uh, through this device, they could stick to the uh, pyramid. So there's a scraper. Uh, so as the chips come around, the scraper will knock them off either side. Uh, the hydraulic roll position of power unit, or HPU, uh, is a, it consists of a flooded suction pumping system with an accumulator mounted on a 20 U.S. gallon skid mounted reservoir. The, uh, there's an air and oil heat exchanger and tank heater to uh, provide temperature control in hot and cold ambient environments. So make sure that we have our hydraulic oil at the proper, proper viscosity. Uh, the solenoid valve supplies directional control to the cylinders, so we can actually uh, position the dynamic roll where you want it to be. Uh, additional controls provide high temperature control switch and low fluid switch, so if there's a problem with the power unit or you lose oil level, you'll get an alarm. Uh, if it gets too hot, you get an alarm. Uh, all the controls are uh, closed in the need for weatherproof protection. Motor requirements for the Model 60, which is a six foot wide machine, six foot long shaft, uh, rolls, uh, two 100 horsepower motors. For the Model 80, which is eight feet across, uh, two 150 horsepower motors. And each of these has a 100. Uh, 1.5 kilowatt heater in uh, the reservoir. The uh, control console that comes with this uh, operates the dyne yield conditioner and a hydraulic power, roll power, uh, roll position and power unit. And it's also enclosed in a NEMA 4 enclosure and it's remotely mounted. It can be hooked into the uh, company's uh, PLC system. Of course, there's speed switches on both rolls for zero speed detection. And proximity sensors uh, indicate to the operators that the nip between rolls is ready for wood processing. So when you set the stops of where you want the rolls to be, uh, you'll run the roll into position. The proximity sensor will 
pick up that position and say, okay, you're ready to go. Because when you do any maintenance and you open those rolls up, uh, you don't want to be running chips with the rolls wide open. This is, uh, this is what chips look like after they've come through the conditioner. Uh, you can see all the fissures in the chips. Now, you know, someone raised a question to me concerning the uh, ability to analyze what, how effective this is. Uh, talking about chip slicers in the past where you could actually measure the product and see what the thickness is coming out of the product. With these chips and uh, the conditioning of chips, uh, you can no longer do that because while the chip might look like it's an inch and a half thick, it could pulp just like a, a normal chip of 8 millimeters, 6 millimeters. And there's, uh, the only way that I know of, of, of verifying the performance is, well, there's two ways, actually. One is just pulping studies, watching what's happening with the pulp at the different nip settings to see how much uh, penetration or how much rejects you're uh, either promoting or preventing. And the second method, there's a uh, warehouser has a, had developed a process where they take uh, chips that have been uh, conditioned under different pressures and actually did a, uh, a water absorption, soaking the water for a period of time, and then weighed the chips again to see how much moisture they actually uh, sucked in during a period. It makes pretty good sense, and I, I do not have all the details on, on that, but I think the guys at Warehouse can help you out if you have a question that way. There's an alternate to... Uh, oversized processing, and that is the uh, chip sizer, Jeffrey, Raider Jeffrey chip sizer. Some of the advantages, uh, consistent performance over the entire recommended life of the grates and hammers, uh, large heat opening, there's no chance of plugging this little monster, and it tolerates tramp metal quite well. So a lot of the stuff could pass through there because it, it's just hammers and grates, so there's generous openings. The uh, chip sizer has a lower tip speed than a regular hog would have, so it does more cutting of the chips than crushing of the chips. The hammers have been redesigned uh, from regular hog to hammers that would promote better chip reduction, and these sweep angles have been sharpened to provide uh, a better cut through. At the beginning of the program, we talked about uh, fine screening. Well, there's a few options for fine screening, and gyratory screens, and we use a lot of these, but this is our screen. This is the Raider, uh, Jeffrey Raider Raider Wave. Key benefits of the Raider Wave. It, it has a super high efficiency in finder's removal. This, this deck actually bounces quite, quite rapidly and sorts the pins and finds and gets them through. We'll go into a little more of that in a minute. It, if you have a stockpile of pin chips with finds and you want to recover the pin chips, this is excellent for uh, running those pins over this deck getting the fines out and retaining the pins. It doesn't plug, and it doesn't blind, and snow and ice won't stop it. So it, it, it's used quite a bit up in, the, in, the, in Canada. Uh, because of the action of the deck, the, the deck is self-cleaning, and they are easily replaced. Uh, along with the decks, of course, we have a very a large variety of openings we can put in the decks uh, to depend, you know, determine by what your final result is, if it's a particular size classification you're looking for or something special you want to do with that product, uh, this fine, this right away deck has very uh, wide variety of deck openings. This is what the bars look like underneath the deck. Uh, they're tri-roll bars. These bars rotate, and these three bars pop against the this urethane decking. So as the materials come by, these uh, rotors rotate, and they pop that deck, 
And when they pop that deck, they release the more dense chips or pins because more mass goes higher. The fines will fall through because there's more opening area. So this actually bouncing up and down will uh, do a great job of screening. Here you see the three rolls here on each of the shaft assemblies. And this deck is held held down just counterweighted. So this deck is, is free to move with the ship load on it. And then as it rotates, it bounces, the fines come through, and the pins and accepts come off the end. Here's a view of the, the deck, and these are the, the side covers. The, the deck's put on in sections. These are metal bands, or, and they're all bolted together. It looks like a lot of work, but it's, it's not too difficult to replace these decks. Uh, of course, this is a polychain drive. And with all polychain drive, you want to keep them clean because dirt and contaminants in there will just tear up these belts. So we provide a good seal and an easily removable cover to uh, protect the uh, drives. Like I said, these decks are easily replaced. A uh, wide, wide variety of uh, sizes and geometry of the holes and the openings. And the inclination could be adjustable. Uh, it's an option that's made available, so it can be certain times of the year you might want to run it steeper or more shallower other times of the year. It's not a lot, but there's only 25 of these machines out there, mostly, like I said, in, in Canada, uh, where they're very useful, especially in the, in the snow and the ice. What we expect in a well-designed CTS system is about 90% of overthick removal efficiency and less than 10% accepts carryover. Now, in the chips that go over the end of the deck, uh, there's going to be a lot of accepts in there, but the percentage of accepts there as opposed to the accepts in the present, uh, the numbers work out so the accept carryover rate is does it look as bad as it uh, isn't as bad as it appears to me when you first look at it? Uh, to obtain these efficiencies, though, we need uh, to understand what's happening and what what you're trying to do. Uh, we need to you know such things as the species of chips, whether you're looking at hardwoods or softwoods, uh, like you know the minimum and maximum bulk densities. It's good to have a chip thickness distribution uh, so we know what size screen and how much area we need to do the proper job of overthick removal because that's the function is getting the overthick out. Uh, we need to know the volumetric rate, uh, minimum and maximum. We want to know what the, the target chip thickness is. That sort of makes sense. We also want to know how the chips are getting to the system. What, what type of uh, storage system is being employed? And the reason that's important is well, if you have chips in a pile, like in a circular, the circular pile or stacked stack out pile, uh, through time, the uh, bigger size chips, the larger chips, will migrate down to the chip pile. And as you reclaim closer to the pile, uh, you may be reclaiming at the same rate that you were earlier in the pile, but the percentage of over thick and uh, near over thick increases dramatically, and you have to take that into account because those chips are, would be like separating uh, baseballs from tennis balls, pretty much in the same size range, a little hard to separate, whereas when their chips are higher up in the, on the pile, it's more like maybe ping pong balls from tennis balls, so they have a better size distribution, it's easier to separate the small ones out or the big ones out. Reliability. The CTS equipment is highly reliable. Bar screen is designed for 24-7 pulp mill operations under heavy loadings. We expect work surfaces of the bar deck to operate from three to six years for hardwoods and five to eight years for softwoods prior to replacement. Of course, again, depending on the type of chips. Uh, chip conditioner segments are stainless steel, providing long wear life, about one to four years between changes. And if you Introduce trap metal or rocks, that time gets shorter. 
Uh, right away, mat replacements could be on an annual basis. Those are optional screening arrangements. Uh, in this arrangement, fine screening before thickness screening. Uh, some mills have chosen to do this, and what they do is they get the fines and pins out. A bunch of accept chips comes out. What that does is lighting, lighten the load to this thickness screen. So in this scenario, we have the chips come into a scalping screen somewhere in the system. Uh, those chips to the fine screen. The agitation on the fine screen, get out the fines. The pins and accepts go to the accepts belt. The ores off the fines, which is overs and accepts to the thickness screen. Always removed to the air density separator as before. Here's an illustration of that very same thing. Here's a gyratory screen feeding a flat bar screen. You see in this picture, here's a gyratory screen. It happens to have a star feeder above it. Gyratory screen feeding the bar screen. Uh, the, the accepts through the bar screen down to the process. And in this instance, the, what comes over the bar screen also goes over about three scalping, scrolls, scalping rolls, like a disc screen, to get any slabs of gross holes out, and they would drop down to be disregarded to the ground. Uh, the chips that pass through that screen go down to the ADS system and onward to the chip, classifier, chip processor, over the chip processor. So maintenance considerations. Uh, bar screen preventive maintenance weekly. Uh, check all covers, make sure they're in place and function properly. Uh, monthly, you want to check to reduce your oil level. Uh, make sure you get all bearings lubricated. Check all attachments, bolts, nuts, bearings, set screws. And quarterly, you want to check polychain drive tension and adjust if necessary. And it's important. Uh, inspect all polychain drive and other sprockets for wear. And clean and inspect all of the uh, drive covers and seals. Check all flexible lubrication lines and shafts, the lines to the shafts, rather, because that's how these bearings inside get lubricated, those flexible, flexible hoses. On an annual basis for the uh, bar screen preventive maintenance, inspect all the bar decks for wear. Replace all polychain drive and driven belts. Replace all interior flexible lubrication lines to the outer shafts and check speed sensors and vibration switches for proper operation. Check the lubrication system to make sure it's functioning and inspect all idler bearings. And they specify the manufacturer's uh, check gearbox reducer lubricants. These are the, uh, the belts that you tension. These are, these are the, the arrangement idlers. I said this shaft and this shaft are tied together, this shaft and this shaft are tied together to the belt drive, but this shaft and this shaft are mechanically tied together to the, to the bar deck. So keeping everything in line and in proper tension is quite important. And over-tensioning these belts is just as bad as under-tensioning them. So strict attention should be paid to when these are being checked to make sure the tensions are all poss possible. Uh, there's a method of doing it. It's a timing tool that holds all these shafts, keeps the shafts from moving. And so a timing tool. Slacken the uh, idlers, tension idlers. Uh, slacken the ring cutter bolts on the shafts. So it allows these sprockets to rotate. And tension the belt by adjusting the, the idler. And then, of course, tighten the ring cutter bolts recheck the tensioning, and you're set to go. This is, a, this is a timing tool being installed, and this is a timing tool installed. Uh, key on the top, key on the top, key on the bottom, key on the bottom. Uh, dining yield 2, preventive maintenance. Uh, on a weekly basis, all guards and covers in place, make sure they function properly. Uh, check hydraulic unit fluid level. Check for any leaks. And at three month levels, you want to grease bearings and dynamic the bearing slide. That's the slide that allows that dynamic roll to come in and out. Uh, grease motor and gearbox seals. 
and uh, check your reducer your oil levels. On a six month interval, uh, we usually check the roll segments for damage. Uh, check the roll scrapers for location and alignment. Sometimes during uh, use, those scrapers could be knocked out of, not out of position, so it's good to check to make sure they're still functional. Uh, check the speed sensors for operation and interlocking. Then check the V-belt drive on the drives. On an annual basis, uh, annual basis, full inspection for wear, damage, leaks, etc. Uh, change hydraulic fluid and filter in the power unit. Uh, clean filters, clean fluid, always better for the power unit. Uh, check your roll segment bolts for damage and replace them if necessary. And it's specified by by the manufacturer to change the gear oil uh, reducer lubricant. Uh, tip size for preventive maintenance. Uh, recommended maintenance is inspect grates and hammers quarterly. Change grates and hammers annually. And actually, the grates and hammers last a lot more than the uh, recommended life. Thanks for your time, and if you have any questions, I guess now is the time to ask them. Hey, this is Joey Tomlinson. I work with George Pacific. How are you today? Fine. Can I have your name again, please? I didn't catch. I got a little garbled signal. I'm sorry. Joey Tomlinson with GP. Oh, hi, Joey. Can you hear me okay? Yes. What What is the, the purpose of using the conditioner versus the resizer? Um, does the conditioner just allow for more volume? Well, the the conditioner actually does not produce fines and pins. It takes the overfit chips and conditions them. Uh, of course, it's it's more expensive than the chip sizer. And you have to remember the history that uh, Jeffrey introduced the chip sizer in direct competition with Raider a few years back. So now we're together and we're selling. You know, at one time we're competing projects, but now they're uh, cohabitating in the same company. But the advantage of the chip conditioner was like the, the big advantage over the, the chip slicer, which was originally used, was it didn't produce fines and pins. It just conditioned the chips. Now, the chip sizer, it's going to produce some fines and some pins uh, more than the chip conditioner will. But in reality, the, the amount it produces as in relationship to the total amount in the system, it, it's not going to be a handicap. It won't. It's not detrimental. Uh, and then again, there's a value. The uh, chip sizer is a lot less expensive to maintain and purchase than the chip conditioner. Oh, okay. Here's a question: Do you inst do you recommend st installing a magnet after the scalping screen? Uh, Probably magnet before the scalping screen would be more beneficial because after the scalping screen, uh, you've already got product going through, and if you have, say, a, a bolt that can go through the scalping screen, the magnet won't pick it up unless you're going to the accept, unless the throughput from the disk screen goes on a belt to the screening building, then you could put it. It's just a matter of being sure that you could get the metal on the system. Here's a question, how would you suggest the mill determine if the thickness screen has worn enough to justify replacement? Uh, replacement of the screen or the bars. If you have a thickness screen where the initial IFO is 7.5 millimeters for an 8 millimeter chip, and you had half inch bars and you've worn them down to uh, 3 eighths bars, it's time to replace them because you could make do an actual measurement to see what the wear is on the bar. And I see Bill Fuller asked another question. How would you compare the chip size and performance for the chip conditioner? I think I just talked about that a little bit. The uh, chip sizer seems to do what people are liking the results, but they're not conditioning the chips, and they do produce a little bit more fines and pins than the chip conditioner. Uh, here's another question. Uh, does the chip conditioner produce less fines than the slicer? Absolutely. Because if you have a 9 millimeter chip, you go into a 6 inch slicer gap, uh, you're going to get a 6 inch or 6 millimeter chip and a 3 millimeter chip and a bunch of fines and uh, pins. So the conditioner 
definitely produces less fines than the ship slicer. Anybody else? Okay, thank you for your participation, and uh, have a good day.